Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. So you're you're an artist, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I always I feel weird saying like artist, like capital A artist, but I like to paint. I do a lot of artsy okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Have you uh Have you ever done anything combining art and science? Not necessarily. I had to think hard about that. I don't know. I don't know what, uh, that I could think of. What about you? Oh, so um, it's funny you said about the capital A artist, right? Um, it's weird to say. I don't. I don't do anything with visual arts. Uh, a like painting, drawing, nothing like that's my medium. Okay. I I am a musician, right? Uh, and I have made science songs, created, performed science. Oh, I'm so excited. Key songs before yeah uh there's evidence of this out in the world you could do some googling um and actually <laughs> i wish people could see faces on, on the <laughs> podcast uh i i have actually thought about doing a little bit of it for for the podcast it hasn't worked quite yet but let's just say that there's potential someday in the future for some some science inspired music to appear oh my god in the feeds. This is the perfect opportunity. You just tack, tack it on at the end as a little gateway science music. I don't have the time to do that a week mm. before our meeting, but maybe, maybe someday. Okay. So f- depending on whether you want this or not, fingers crossed for <laughs> yay or nay. <laughs> <laughs> Science is fascinating, but don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. Okay, so it's day four of our special series from our annual meeting. And the theme of today is art and innovation. So are you saying that we actually talked about something? In like in our prompt that is related to the episode, <laughs> this never happened. We did. I know. You know, it's it's harder than it looks out here. But enough of enough of us. Uh, today, we're just going to get right into it and hear from Laura Gurton on how she combines art and science to communicate to broader audiences. Great. Let's hear it. I'm talking with Professor Laura Gurton, and we're going to talk about some of the ways you engage your students. And I would imagine engaging students and the public on science issues can sometimes be a challenge. At what point did you realize that you needed to come up with new ways of doing that? (laughs) I've been crocheting for a number of years, and several years ago I started crocheting temperature data been crocheting temperature data for a while. And then back in 2018, I attended a program down at the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, or LUMCOM it's called. They invited a group of scientists and science communicators to come together to the Louisiana coast to help them tell stories of what they were calling coastal optimism. So all the stories you typically hear about the Louisiana coast are doom and gloom, right? right? Sea levels rising, the coast is subsiding. The bayou's we, being destroyed. Exactly. Hurricanes. So, yeah. Right, right, which, which is true. That's right. all happening. But there are actually a lot of initiatives and positive outcomes to some of the programs that are taking place, some that are driven by the local people. And so they brought us down there to meet the locals, to visit some different field sites. And they said, as a part of this program we're doing, we would like you to help us tell those stories and find ways to share the successes or these ideas of optimism and hope on the Louisiana coast. And so when I finished that program and I came back home, I was thinking, well, I could crochet because I know how to do that. (laughs) And But I really thought about how can I push myself because meeting those individuals that live on the Louisiana coast and hearing their stories, just coming from their heart and their kindness and this urgency that they had. I was like, I I need to do right by this and I need to find other ways besides writing a blog post or recording an audio file. And so when I came home from my flight, which of course was delayed flying into Philadelphia where I live, is there's always a flight delay and come into my house and I see my sewing machine and this unfinished quilting project sitting on my dining room table. I was like, I wonder if I could actually create a quilt about some of the stories that I heard down there. And so I started thinking of what is a story I could tell 
with a quilt. And by the end, I had nine quilts done. And so I have this whole collection now that's called Stitching Hope for the Louisiana Coast, where I've taken several of the stories I heard and I've made quilts out of them. And they're currently on display right now. And I've continued quilting. I'm quilting quilt, uh, smaller quilts now about climate solutions. And I just recently went on an ocean expedition for two months on Joydee's resolution. And now I'm going to be creating quilts relating to my ocean experiences too. How do you put a story in fabric? So fabric choice is the key. It really <laughs> is. And so there are so many beautiful quilts out there. And what I try to do is not make the design complicated of the quilt, but have fabrics that relate to the components of the story as I'm pulling it together. Now, a quilt by itself, when someone looks at it, they're not going to be able to get the whole story. It does need some additional narrative put behind it. So either some signage or I've created YouTube videos for my quilts to help put the put them in context. But what I love about the quilts is it is attracting audiences more than I imagined. So it's not just scientists that are curious about these stories. It's when I have a quilt on display, it, it attracts everyone because everyone has a favorite blanket or mm -hmm. everyone has a quilt story, something their grandmother made or something that's been handed down in their families on the end of their bed. And so no one feels threatened by a quilt. <laughs> It actually has opened the door to communications to so many people from so many fields and so many generations where they see the quilt and they want to hear the story behind it. And the best part for me is that they take photos and then they share the photos and those stories with additional people. And that's what I want as a scientist. I want people talking about science. I want them to share those narratives. And the quilts have been my conduit to be able to do that. That's amazing. Um, and then the crocheting, tell me a little bit about this project. <laughs> So temperature blankets have been around for a little while. I just hadn't brought it into uh, my own outreach work. And actually, I've shared it with my students, too. We've been uh, I've been showing them that in my classes as well. Where, Are they learning to crochet, too? So we ha we do have some crocheters on campus. I am hoping next year, actually, to get them involved in a collaborative quilt project cool. uh, relating to the United Nations uh, decade, the Ocean Decade of Sustainable Development. So we're we're going for a big theme and a big project, but the, for temperature scarves or temperature blankets, what you do is you look at something like the maximum daily temperature for a particular location, and you have a color that's assigned to a 10 degree band difference. So from 90 to 80 degrees, you might have the color red. If the maximum temperature was between 80 and 70 degrees, you might use the color orange. And then for each day, you crochet a row depending upon what that maximum temperature was. And so you'll have something that's 365 rows by the end of the year, and it's a snapshot of what the temperatures were over time. What a cool idea. And you could use rainfall, you could use snowfall, you could use air quality. It, any data set over time, you could actually put into a visualization through stitching. The one with, with the quilts. I will say when I started doing that and using it as a communication tool for myself, I was actually a little terrified <laughs> bringing my first quilt to an AGU meeting. And I have brought my temperature crocheting as well and hung that as a poster. And I've hung a quilt as a poster before. And I wasn't sure how my science colleagues would view that. Is it where I'm not being as rigorous as I should be? Am I watering it down? And I have to say the most number of people ever to visit one of my posters at EGU has been when I've had yarn or fabric. That <laughs> just brings in the most people. And then other scientists want to share their stories and they're asking me, oh, well, I could do this and I could do that. And they're brainstorming on the spot. So I have to say in my science world, I was afraid of sharing the quilts, but actually it's been warmly accepted and embraced, which I'm thrilled about. For the classroom technique, techniques, I think it's a, a little more challenging because many of us are, are very comfortable with the ways that we teach and the approaches that we use. And so hearing what someone else does, sometimes it's hard to bridge to, well, that's not going to work with my setting or that's not going to work with my students or I have this number of labs I have to do. I couldn't possibly swap that out. So sometimes it takes a little bit more uh, Com conversations and showing the results, the impact on the students. I think when my colleagues hear from the students, their feedback, and, and then they're asking if they can do audio projects in other classes, then it starts to spread. And I think people open up a little bit more to thinking outside the box with the approaches we're using in our classrooms.
Yeah. How do you sort of explain this importance of these collaborations between arts and sciences? Like, how do you lay that out for people? So it's just another tool that we can use. And it's one that hasn't been tapped into much in the past. So there certainly has been science writing that has been going on. That's been increasing as well. And using social media, YouTube videos, right? We have those. But then you have this really creative piece that is non-digital in, in some ways, certainly some of the arts are going to be more digitally driven, but in using fabric or yarn or ceramics or, or whatever that material is, it's interesting to, to get people to think of ways that we can bring in, again, new audiences and to have new conversations with new people instead of scientists talking to scientists all the time. We do that really well, but we need to get our work out there. And art offers us that opportunity to open the door and then bring more people into those conversations. And again, it, with anything that's a little bit new and a little bit different, you do get some resistance sometimes. I'm incredibly fortunate where my institution fully supports my science quilting and even came to my first quilt show that I had. And so it, it's been wonderful to see that, that they realize that this can make a difference and advance our mission as an institution uh, to help educate others. Vicki, have you ever quilted or, and I know they're all different things, but crocheted or knitted or sewn or anything in that medium for like to create art? Oh, so I went through a, a phase, I'll call it, where I would do, um, I would make scarfs, fin like finger knit them. Oh. Uh, so you use your you... like fingers as the knitting oh, needles. Fascinating. Yeah. I couldn't tell you how to do it. I don't remember, but I went through a whole like skinny scarf, skinny, like wide knit scarf phase. Do you still have these scarves? No, but I probably have some pictures somewhere of these <laughs> scarves. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Have you, are you a sewer? Uh, I, so I, yeah, I don't do anything creatively. Uh, mm -hmm. I sew out of necessity. I, I okay. bought a sewing machine last year, but that's mainly to mend stuff. And I'm, oh. I'm honestly not very good at it. Uh, like, yeah, as previously described, audio is my medium and I'll leave the physical stuff to those who are much more capable to yeah. literally much more capable hands. Yeah. I agree that you should do that. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Awesome. So with that, uh, that is all from Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Laura Krantz for conducting the interview and to Shane for producing the episode. Audio engineering was by Colin Warren with artwork by Olivia Ambrosio. If you'd like to see video for at least part of this interview, you can head over to YouTube and search for AGU TV. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review the podcast and you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all and see you tomorrow.